All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law weekly research seminar series. We are very delighted today to be uh, discussing, we talk a lot about democracy, but today to be discussing autocracy with three co-authors working on a project together. The first is Jason Brownlee, who is a former CDDRL postdoc. He's a professor of government at the University of Texas, Austin, and works on authoritarianism, U.S. foreign policy, and Asian politics. The second is Ashley Anderson, who is an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, who works on the Middle East and contentious politics. And finally, Killian Clark, who is assistant professor at Georgetown School of Foreign Service, who also works on the Middle East and protest uh, and revolution. So to kick us off, I think we will turn things over to Jason. Uh, if you have any questions, Zoom audience, over the course of the talk, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to them during the Q&A session. And for those of you in the room, just know that you will be on camera once we are in the Q&A portion of the talk. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now it's uh, great to be with you all today. I want to uh, start, it's, it's kind of uh, fun to, to sort of virtually uh, return to Stanford and, and CDDRL, where I, I spent a great uh, postdoc year, and I'm happy to be sharing this uh, work that, that Ashley and Jillian and I have been working on um, uh, really almost during most of the pandemic, really. <laughs> so there's been a lot of virtual talks for us. Um, I want to especially thank uh, Didi and Amy for uh, the for the logistics, and uh, I want to thank Hisham Salam for uh, for making this all happen. So, what we're going to talk about today is uh, is kind of a conceptual intervention, but we think it has broad uh, practical and theoretical implications as well. And before I dive into the slides, I'd like you to ask you to engage in uh, a couple of thought experiments with me. So, one is when you think about autocracies. You think about an autocracy. What do you visualize? What, what regimes come to mind? I'd just like to sort of get that in your head. And I could actually even maybe uh, say if you were playing Family Feud and the category was autocracies and Steve Harvey's asking for, for your answer, what would you think is going to be high up on the board there? And then a second question, uh, a dynamic question, what do you think is going on with these autocracies around the world? Kind of what's the trend? Um, are we seeing more of them? Are we seeing less of them? Okay, so just keep that in mind. We'll, we may look back to, those, uh, to this thought experiment later in the talk. So what are the defining traits of autocracies? This is the, the question that concerns us. And uh, Ashley Killian and I, have been you know, closely involved in, in different projects in our own solo work and looking at different kinds of authoritarian regimes, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. And we're, we're very you know, curious about like, what is it that really makes an autocracy an autocracy? Like, what is it that is distinctive about these regimes? We have a whole field now, it's really blossomed in the past 20 years, of competitive, comparative authoritarianism, comparative autocracy and dictatorship studies, what are the defining traits of these regimes? And interestingly, the tendency is to, for scholars to answer in the negative, to say that autocracies are not democracies. They're regimes that don't have elections. And we want to argue for replacing this with a, an, an understanding that actually says what autocracies are a substantive understanding. And there are many ways to answer that question, like substantively, what makes an autocracy an autocracy? The answer that we are proposing today is that an autocracy is a regime with exclusive political rule. So there's something about autocracies that's not just the lack of elections, it's the presence of a particular type of rule, exclusive political rule. And we show in the paper that adopting this substantive understanding has some pretty big theoretical and empirical implications. If you look around the world today and you look at the major data sets, a lot of them are splitting the world in two. 
democracies and in non-democracies. And everything that's not a democracy just gets counted as an autocracy. And it turns out that a large chunk of those, we estimate about 18 to 30% of them, so like around a quarter or more, are actually not auto autocratic. They're, they're somewhere in between democracy and autocracy, but they're not really autocracies. So they fall short of democracy, but they don't substantively count uh, as autocracies. And the recent post-Cold War period, or the past you know, 30 years, is actually less autocratic in substantive terms than previously assumed. So we have a rise in all kinds of regimes that are not democratic. We don't want to invite them to the, the summit of democracies. They may be competitive authoritarian. They may in other ways fall short of the minimum democratic threshold that we know from Dahl and Schumpeter and Carl and Schmitter and, and many others, but they're not autocracies in a substantive sense. Uh, and in particular, we think that party-based autocracies, which are a big part of the literature, are less prevalent than previously reported. That a lot of these cases that are called party-based autocracies really belong kind of in the middle, or maybe in some cases they're just, they're, they basically are democracies. Uh, and that's because we, they don't actually present this type of politically exclusive rule that we believe is, is the core substantive criterion of autocracy. So here's where we would like to go in the rest of the talk, and I'll be passing the baton uh, to Killian for the middle portion, and he'll be handing it off to Ashley after that. Um, but I'm going to start for the next few slides. We're going to go over some of these existing approaches. Now, I made some big claims already about how people are dividing up the world, how they're relying on this residual definition of non-democracy. And we're going to back that up with examples from the literature. Then we'll move into the substantive approach of autocracy as exclusive political rule, talk about um, one way of operationalizing it, uh, and then the implications that would flow from that. I would say, though, with respect to parts three and four, we, um, uh, we're doing our best to like, hone the operationalization, and we, we've experimented with a few different approaches, but really that's downstream from the conceptual debate where we would really like to have a kind of you know, robust battle of ideas, because we really think whether it's our idea of exclusive political rule or some other idea, that the field, the scholars, the, the students of ours who are really interested in authoritarianism, who want to sign up for our classes on authoritarianism, that we need some type of substantive definition to, to work on, to not just say authoritarianism is when a country doesn't qualify as a democracy. Um, and then, okay, and then part five, we will we'll conclude. So to get into these existing approaches, now it's been largely kind of quantitative literature that has divided the world in two and used a residual definition. Prior to that, we have work like Juan Lenz's work and others that did have a substantive definition of authoritarianism and autocracy. Here's Lenz's when he was writing about the authoritarian regime of Franco Spain. Many of you could probably say this, but you know, re rehearse this by heart. Political systems with limited, not responsible political pluralism, without elaborate and guiding ideology, but with distinct ment mentalities, without extensive nor intensive mobilization, except at some points in their development, in which a leader or occasionally a small group exercises power within formally ill-defined limits. So pretty, um, pretty uh, verbose, lengthy uh, definition from Lenz. A difficult one to operationalize systematically, and, and to my knowledge, he really did not attempt to do that, uh, although he did do some cross-national comparative work. Um, generally speaking, he wasn't dealing with global um, data sets, but this is a useful starting point to think about like, how people were studying authoritarianism uh, in the early post-war period when they were saying, okay, we've got totalitarianism, it, which is basically only applying to, to Nazi Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union, but there are a lot of other regimes out there where something is going on. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what authoritarianism is. In recent decades, really starting in the 1990s with some very important work on democracy and economic development, the tendency was to shift to a 
residual category. And I should say that this is largely uh, an approach taken up in the quantitative li literature. Qualitative scholars, well, I would include, uh, of course, uh, our, our friend and colleague who may be in the webinar today, Larry Diamond, you know, Linz and Lipset, they generally were able to stick with substantive categories, but there was a, a, a strong trend in the quantitative literature in, to use a residual approach. And it really coheres and kind of consolidates with the um, Alvarez, Shebu, Lemongi, and Jaworski work in 1996, the Skid article, and then the subsequent World Politics article by Jaworski and Lemongi, and then, of course, the book Democracy and Development in 2000. With these works, autocracy began to be defined as a residual. And here's the quote that we pull out from Alvarez. They say it. They're very, they're very clear. We treat dictatorship simply as a residual category perhaps better denominated as not democracy. That's, that's their definition. Our procedure is to establish rules that disqualify a particular regime as democratic without worrying about the nature of the regimes eliminated in this manner. So you know, they're interested in seeing whether uh, development led to democracy, testing modernization uh, theory, testing uh, you know, Lipsitz arguments uh, about prerequisites for democracy. They're not really interested in authoritarianism as a problem the way you know, Lenz was wrestling with authoritarianism in Franco Spain. And so that's very clear in their approach. What's interesting is the way that this approach, which was very explicitly designed for a study of de democracy and democratic stability as the de dependent variable, then gets adopted as a baseline for work on authoritarianism and authoritarian stability as the dependent variable. Key works from the past decade, Milan's Volek's Politics of Authoritarian Rule, Getty's Rights in France, How Autocracies Work. Zolik, I define a dictatorship to be a country that fails to elect its legislature and executive in free and competitive elections. Uh, GWF, the absence of fair, reasonably competitive elections through which citizens choose those who make policies on their behalf defines autocracy or dictatorship. So this is, this is the standard, this is the convention. And for those of us who have worked in the authoritarianism literature, we are we're very accustomed to using it. Um, we had a, one of our um, uh, participants last week when we had a, the virtual conference for um, Southern Political Science Association meeting said, you know, when he starts his course on authoritarianism, he actually says, hey, students, undergraduate students, we're going to be using a residual definition this whole semester. Uh, we're going to be saying authoritarianism is lack of democracy. And he admitted he wasn't very satisfied with that. So we think that it, this is not, um, not really a controversial point. And this is also not like a gotcha moment. Like I, in my own work, have you used this residual definition for a while. I mean, it's, it's, it, it has benefits in terms of the, the practicality of coding, but substantively and conceptually, it's, it's become a problem and I think we can, do, we can do much better. And so what are the implications for this in terms of just like the, the concept ladder? Think about a Giovanni, Giovanni Sartori concept ladder. What are, what's the conceptual move that we're asking you to do here? What we're asking to do is to move one step down the concept ladder, that the current literature is at the, the middle level here, a contrast between democratic regimes that are defined substantively in terms of elect, mainly in terms of electoral contestation and everything else, the non-democracies and their autocracy, authoritarianism, it's just a residual category. We are proposing to move one level down, democracies remain democracies, but then among this residual category, we get the substantive autocracies, politically exclusive rule in the bottom right. And then we have right here in the middle, a new category of non-autocratic non-democracies. So there is a residual, there's no way to have, to, to fully map out the space um, without a residual. But this is a residual that is defined on either flank 
by very important substantive phenomena that drive broad literature and research agendas. Okay, so we think we are we are doing something different here than other articles, other works that have had some type of concept ladder dealing with hybrid regimes. And we'll, we'll say a little bit more later about what's going on in this middle category. But really our, our main contribution and intervention is to say that authoritarianism students, young and old, really wanna study these cases. They wanna study the cases that are gonna be at the top of the family feud board. And they wanna understand how those work. And in order to understand how the substantive autocracies work, we need to have a definition, we need to have an operationalization, and we need to be able to set aside the ones that definitely are not democracies, but are also not substantive autocracies. And from there, I will uh, hand the torch to Killian. Great, yeah, uh, thank you, Jason. Um, and um, uh, thanks, uh, just repeating uh, that, Jason's thanks for inviting us and, and um, uh, great to be here. So uh, uh, just to sort of repeat a little bit of some of the points Jason has, has already made quite well, um, uh, so our, our main proposal here is, um, right, that we should really be returning to a substantive understanding and a substantive approach to conceptualizing autocracy. Now we have a different specific definition, but you know, we are sort of inspired in some senses by this, this older literature, this, the, the literature um, associated with Juan Lenz, which did at one point embrace a substantive approach. Um, and, and again, Jason has sort of said this already to some extent, but the justification for using a substantive approach um, is, is sort of threefold. Um, the first is that any research agenda really we think needs to be based on a category and set of concepts um, that, that's capturing something uh, uh, underlying with, with, with sort of you know, proper ontological coherence, right? A, a phenomenon uh, that has a coherent set of criteria and properties and characteristics that define it, right? That's not just something um, defined in contrast to or in opposition to something else. Um, the, the second reason we think we really need to return to a substantive uh, uh, approach to autocracy is because we actually think that there is an implicit understanding of what autocracy is kind of out there, both in, in, in um, sort of everyday parlance, but also in the academic scholarship. So that's one of the reasons that Jason asked all of you to picture in your heads at the beginning, what do you envision when you think of an autocracy? Um, and, and, you know, um, my guess would be, and, and this is reflected again in the literature, is that we, we talk about a set of sort of prototypical regimes, regimes like uh, Stalin's Russia, like Saddam Hussein's Iraq, like Pinochet's Chile, like, um, like China, that, that do have a set of um, underlying uh, shared characteristics that have ontological coherence. Um, and when we look at the literature, we see that those are in fact the examples that people are always invoking when they're writing about and talking about and theorizing about autocracy. And so we are proposing that we need a, a, a set of concepts that actually align to what we think is actually already an implicit um, a set of some common understandings about what this term really means. Um, and then finally, point three here is that we think actually that by, by using a substantive approach to autocracy, we will um, help with research on aut autocracy directly that the, the, you know, the, the, the authoritarianism literature that has been flourishing over the last years and decades. But actually we also think that this will be helpful for adjacent uh, scholarly fields um, in the, 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 the uh, realm of sort of democratization studies um, and particularly on uh, in research that's looking at questions of uh, de democratic ba uh, backsliding and democratic breakdown, which of course are issues that um, are quite resonant today and a lot of people are, are concerned about today, we think that by using a, a, a substantive uh, approach to autocracy, we can start to have actually more productive conversations about democratic backsliding because we don't need to come out and say that every time that there's been a regression away from democracy, we don't need to come out and say that, that um, you know, Hungary under Orban or um, even the United States under Donald Trump has suddenly regressed into autocracy, right? We can have more productive conversations about what democratic backsliding is act, uh, actually entails without having to make somewhat outlandish claims about, um, again, these, these, these borderline regimes suddenly becoming fully autocratic. Um, okay, Jason, next slide. 
So that takes us to our um, specific definition of autocracy. Um, Jason, again, has alluded to this already. Um, so we are defining autocracy as exclusive political rule. Um, so much shorter uh, and we're, we're hoping more manageable than the original Lindsayan definition. Um, the definition has, has two criterion. Um, so relatively simple, we're hoping to operationalize and work with. Uh, the first criterion is rule. Um, there actually has to be a consolidated rule in a polity. Um, and what we mean by this is that, you know, we can't be in, in a situation where there's some sort of transitional state, where things are in flux, where perhaps there, there's a situation of anarchy or civil war, and no one group has actually taken power and consolidated it. So there has to be a situation where one person or one ruling group has actually consolidated their hold on power and does, in fact, rule the country. The second and perhaps more important criterion that we use um, is that there has to be exclusion. Um, and what we mean by that is that there's um, deliberate prevention of all political challengers from accessing executive power or from formally influencing executive decision making. Um, so a couple, a couple points on, on this criterion. So we focus on the executive here, right? The executive is the most important decision making uh, institution and body in a government. And, and so given that that's where the key decision-making power lies, that's where we're focusing on. So we're not talking about competition for, you know, authoritarian legislatures, for, for example, or judiciaries, right? We're really focused on the institution of the executive. Um, and, um, you know, this exclusion in the way we're operationalizing it here sort of takes two forms, right? So we're saying exclusion means you're basically not sharing power with anyone else. Right? So no political challengers are allowed to influence decision making. You're not engaging in any sort of um, distribution of those responsibilities. And you're also not giving any of your political opponents or challengers an opportunity to try to replace you right? or to become the dominant group um, um, themselves. And this, this uh, you know, again, we'll, we'll talk about this when we talk about some of these categories of, uh, uh, that are in the middle. But but this level of political exclusion, we think is, is setting a pretty high bar. So there could be some level of competition that's taking place between your political challengers. Um, and, and, and that doesn't have to be to the full extent of free and fair elections. Um, so, you know, there could be some sort of competition that doesn't quite rise to the bar of free and fair elections. That would, that, that, that would, that would, that would, we would count that as not a situation of political exclusion. Right, but that would also not count, of course, as a, as a pure democracy. So that's where some of these liminal cases start to come into come come, um, come become clearer, and we're going to talk about that in, in a sec. Um, Jason, next slide. Yeah. Um, okay. So so what um, what what what, do, what are we not using to define autocracy? This is almost as important uh, a conversation as being clear about what we are using as as inclusion criteria. So we talk about five different criteria that have at certain points of time been put forward as constitutive of, of the concept of, of autocracy that we are, we are claiming are, are not actually, don't belong in the definition. So the first is um, political participation. Um, this of course goes back to the original, um, uh, some, you know, the original framework proposed by, by Dahl when he was conceptualizing polyarchy. Um, right, he said that democracies have there are two criteria that that define democracy: the extent the extent of uh, political inclusion or inclusion, which is a criterion we're using, and then the second of his was the extent of political participation. Right, how many people are eligible to participate in um, the electoral process? We're we're saying that that doesn't belong in any um, definition of autocracy. So uh, a, a politically exclusive regime. Uh, that allows for you know open and wide participation in authoritarian elections that don't actually mean anything. That 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 open and wide participation doesn't make that regime less autocratic. So that's not a criterion that that belongs. Um, the second criterion that we that we kind of discard um, is this notion that uh, autocracies are defined by some sort of ideology or uh, by their uh, the, the, their mobilizational capacity. These are criteria that were really important for Linz. Um, and um, we, we, we are kind of taking those and setting those aside, right? We think autocracies vary in all kinds of different ways according to their ideologies and their mobilizational capacity, right? So that doesn't really belong in the definition. Um, we don't think autocracies are defined by how responsive they are to citizens' demands. Um, again, that's something that varies a lot across autocracies. Some autocracies actually are very responsive, right? And there's actually been some interesting 
research over the last decade that's shown that, that autocracies do in fact respond to de citizen demands in certain cases um, and in certain ways. So, um, so that's not something we think should be in the definition. Um, we also don't think that the definition uh, should, should include anything to do with institutions, right? Some autocracies are highly institutionalized. Um, and some autocracies, uh, you know, personalist autocracies are virtually devoid of, of, of any proper executive institutions. So that's also not something we think should be in the definition. Um, I should note as an aside that, that our uh, definition of autocracy, of, of course, doesn't preclude further subcategorization, right? So this notion of exclusive political rule includes military regimes, it includes monarchies, it includes personalist regimes, um, all of these subcategories and, and typologies that have been developed, you know, many of these would fit under our heading of exclusive rule. Um, it's sort of that's the level of that, that, or that's the level below the one that we're talking about. And then finally, and maybe this is the most controversial of the criterion that we sort of set aside. We don't believe autocracies are defined by violence, right? By their use of violence. Um, now we recognize and we note that of course, uh, uh, maintaining and affecting political exclusion does often require the use of violence, um, but it doesn't always require the use of violence and it doesn't require the continual use of violence, right? So if political exclusion is a situation that comes to be taken for granted or accepted by the political opposition, by everyday citizens, then actually many autocratic regimes don't have to use violence all the time. Um, and so again, we think that's actually a variable um, that, that, that varies across autocracies and is not actually um, constitutive of them. Great, okay, so then now we are, uh, we're back to this um, concept of NANs, right? So Jason, um, in, in the um, uh, tree that we pointed out, the concept tree that we, or the concept ladder that we had on an earlier slide, we noted that um, with the creation of a substantive category of autocracy, we implicitly carve out a new residual, which occupies this space between substantive democracy and substantive autocracy. Um, and any, really any, you know, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive categorization of regimes probably does need to have a, a residual category somewhere, right? Um, we're calling this residual category non-autocratic non-democracies. And the reason we're, we're putting forward a new concept, um, rather than just kind of dusting off the, the well-worn concepts of hybrid regimes or anocracies, is we really do feel that those categories don't accurately reflect what we're getting at here in, in the truly residual nature of this category. Um, the reason is that, so we, we've sort of thought this through and we specified five different types of regimes that, that occupy this NAND category. There, there may be others, but we think these are the five main types. Um, and these are again, informed by how we're thinking about uh, autocracy and, our, and, our, and those, those inclusion criteria that I talked about. So the first three NAN types are anarchies, foreign occupations, and transitional regimes. These, we argue, are, are, are situations in which really there isn't, a, there isn't consolidated rule, right? And so therefore, we don't have this, a, a situation of autocracy. Um, so these transitional regimes, you know, we don't really know who is going to be in power yet. That's the, the governing arrangements haven't been decided on. A foreign occupation is, is, is supposed to be a temporary arrangement. Um, and an anarchy situation is one where really nobody controls the state. Um, the fourth category, this is a category that comes originally from Dahl's framework, um, is what we're calling competitive oligarchies. And so a competitive oligarchy is a situation like apartheid South Africa, or like the United States before the Civil Rights Act, or bef before many countries, uh, or many countries before there was universal suffrage. These are situations where we do have elections um, and there is competition between rival political groups, but we don't have full participation, right? So we don't meet Dahl's final criterion of having full participation and therefore being a democracy, but we do have competition. And so we're, we're therefore not in a, in a situation of autocracy. And then the fifth category is taken directly from the well-known work by Steve Levitsky and Luke Kinway, the notion of a competitive authoritarian regime. So this is a regime in which there is some level of competition between the opposition and the incumbent. Um, the situation is not one of free and fair elections, so there is an imbalance there, but there is a sufficient level of competition and there are actually opportunities for the opposition to press and try to become the dominant group. And so we consider those sufficiently competitive to render them therefore not, not um, uh, autocracies. 
Um, next slide. I think we are coming up on time, so I might just skip through this very quickly. Here, we're basically mapping our conceptualization of, of autocracy against Dahl's framework. This is probably a framework many of you know well. And basically, what this shows here is that our category uh, falls down here at the bottom half of this um, framework because we're only using contestation as, as the inclusion criterion. So both closed and inclusive hegemonies, uh, what, he, what he called closed and inclusive hegemonies would be considered autocracies under our conceptualization. Then we have competitive oligarchy up here and probably competitive authoritarianism falls somewhere here in the middle. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. We have a um, hand showing us there. Um, Good. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley now. Ashley's going to take you through how we operationalize this, um, or how we're thinking about operationalizing it, and then show some of the figures that, that talk about how this um, changes the picture of the world that we have. Okay, so uh, like we said, most of what we're trying to do, the major intervention is, of course, conceptual, but we do kind of need to show that this has empirical implications. And so we're proposing one way of operationalizing it using pretty straightforward um, political events and rules. So what we're trying to do here is, like, like Jason said, kind of siphon off the population of autocracies, and particularly to separate them from this, you know, residual category of non-democracies, right? So the first thing that we need to do is reduce uh, remove those regimes that don't fit the first inclusion criteria. So places where rule has not been consolidated under a single body, and those would comprise our anarchies, our foreign occupations, and our transitional regimes. Now, luckily enough for us, there's a very clear measure that already exists for that, the polity uh, negative 68, 60, or negative 60, 77s, and negative 88s um, all kind of fit that category, so we can just use that measure to excise those regimes. And then what we need to do is take out regimes in which we have effective competition for the executive. Now, keep in mind that that, that competition does not have to be um, as robust as it is in a democracy, right? It doesn't have to meet the bar for free and fair elections, but there has to be enough competition to um, disqualify it from being an exclusive regime. And so what we use as our coding rule is um, autocracies are regimes in which the opposition does not win more than 20% of vote share. So if the opposition is ma manages to get 20% or more of the vote share, then we would consider those sufficiently competitive to not be considered autocracies. So then what we have left over is the population of substantive autocracies, where we have both rule and political exclusion at the executive level, and incumbents in those cases would win elections by 80% or more. Now, this is what we are proposing. And as Jason said, we've been working on this paper for a while, um, experimenting with different operationalizations. And while we haven't had a chance yet to put these particular rules into play, we have used a proxy measure for this um, in previous iterations that gets us really close to these rules. In fact, um, our 80% rule would probably be even more strict. Um, so next slide, Jason. Um, so what happens when we apply these rules? Well, what happens is we get a sample, a set of autocracies that is probably very close to the set of autocracies that you had in mind when Jason asked you to do that thought experiment, right? We have all the heavy hitters, China, uh, North Korea under uh, Kim Jong-un. We have Iran's theocracy, um, Zaire, Iraq under Saddam Hussein, right? Chile under Pinochet, Indonesia under Suharto. And all of these, um, not only do they pick out the paradigmatic autocratic leaders, but they also seem to end at the right time, right? So when Indonesia, when Suharto leaves Indonesia, that is when it stops being an autocracy. And most people who study autocracies would probably agree with that. Um, and then it siphons off all of those uh, regimes that most of us would probably agree are not really autocracies, and particularly not in the way that our category of paradigmatic autocracies are, right? So Lebanon, which that many in the Middle East would debate is an autocracy. Uh, most people would say absolutely not. Um, ends up in our non-autocratic category. Nicaragua is also disqualified uh, after 1984. Our um, dominant party regimes in Malaysia and in Botswana 
also excised from the category. Even Mexico after 1982, once the pre starts to open up competition, um, gets excised from our category of autocracies. And then the, the kind of most interesting regimes that get taken out are the ones in which uh, contemporary politics has noted they fall below the bar for democracy, right? Our Hungries and our Turkeys. Um, but they, they're very clearly not yet autocracies in the way that China is an autocracy. And so those are some other regimes that we think very usefully get taken out of the autocratic category. So in, in general, what this does um, when we apply our proxy measure um, is it takes out, like Jason said, about 18% of autocracies um, from that designation. So whereas um, if, we, if we compare our data set, the ABC data set, to prominent other data sets that cover autocracy, we can see that it excises about uh, 21.9 cases from the uh, Boyce, Miller, and Rosado um, data set from CGB, CGV about 18%, same thing with GWF, and data sets that use kind of um, more liberal measures of autocracy that include those things like violence, et cetera, we get a lot of cases removed. So Hadanias, Terrell, and, um, and Waman takes out about 30%, largely because they use, uh, the po uh, they use Freedom House scores, which take into account civil liberties, and VDEM, we also get about a 30% reduction in cases, which is really interesting. Now, if we looked at this over time, I think this is one of the most fascinating things, right? We see that the over time trends really differ between our, our data set and other data sets. So very clearly um, in the pre-war period, there is a huge gap between the types of or the proportion of autocracies that we find and the proportion of autocracies that very prominent data sets like VDEM finds. And largely this is probably because they are counting things like competitive oligarchies as autocracies. Now, again, those are not democracies. We can all agree on that. But they're clearly, you know, the US before 1965 is not China. So we want those out of our population and our, our data set um, actually removes those in a very good way. We also see that after the third wave, there are a lot fewer um, autocracies. That is largely because countries, again, are moving into this competitive authoritarian realm, um, but are not, um, they're not transitioning to democracy, but they are also no longer substantive autocracies. And um, of note, I know you can't really see too much of it, but this, this trend that VDEM and others have been talking about towards autocratization in our consolidated democracies, right? We don't see a true breakdown um, of democracy in the ways that, you know, we saw when, um, when Mussolini took over Italy, when Hitler took over Germany. We actually see a, a very small uptick from a relatively low floor um, past 2010. The last thing that um, our measure really changes is the types of autocracies that exist, right? The proportion of autocracies according to our classic types, military, monarchy, party, et cetera. And unsurprisingly, the types of autocracies that mostly get excised are our party-based regimes um, and some military regimes. Now that's unsurprising because obviously party-based regimes, uh, particularly those that are multi-party, uh, multi-party non-democracies, right, um, are the ones that allow for competition from the opposition, and in some cases, quite robust competition from the opposition. So you can think about cases like Mexico, right, post-1982, where the opposition is getting upwards of 30, upwards of 40 percent of the vote, or cases like Botswana and Malaysia, where we also see the opposition you know, well exceeding that 20% measure. And so we can see that we find far fewer party-based regimes um, than GWF, right? We find 9% fewer party-based regimes there. I'll, I'll, half of the party-based regimes that uh, Hatanius Torwell and Wadman find, and then also a, a substantial reduction um, from the Magaluna, Chu, and Min uh, data set. So that, that's a really big change. Um, and so in conclusion, there, there are a couple of things that I want to highlight um, as kind of the, the, the big thrust, right, the takeaways from this, uh, this work. Uh, so the first thing is, 
we do need to, for the purposes of uh, just good research, right? We need to have a substantive definition of autocracy. If you picked up any introductory graduate book, they would tell you that you have to have a concept that fits your empirics, right? And so creating a substantive definition allows us to better align our concept with the cases that we're interested in because we can all have the same conversation about what an autocracy is based on this definition. And we can make sure that cases fit into that definition, right? Especially with this 80% rule, which is quite clear. And so we're not gonna stretch our concepts and we're not gonna code regimes that are barely non-democratic as autocratic regimes. The other thing I think that is really interesting is that we have this new residual category of NANs that we can investigate, right? Um, and this is a really fruitful area for research because as Killian said, this is, this is different from hybrids um, and it's explicitly a residual, which means there are several different types of regimes that can be in there. And as uh, people explore NANs, we can get closer to that mutually, uh, mutually, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive um, category of regimes. Um, and then finally, we get better studies of autocracy, regime transition, and democratic erosion and breakdown through this. So one of the implications for autocracy that we imagine are going to happen, it awaits further empirical testing, is that this moving of party-based regime to the NAND category versus them being um, substantive autocracies is very likely going to change our, um, our understanding of what types of regimes are more durable over the long term, right? Because we know there are tons of findings that these multi-party electoral uh, non-democracies basically um, are the ones that survive the longest, but if those aren't really autocracies, right, and they are in fact NAND regimes, then those, those statistics might change. Um, and it also allows us to have kind of more nuanced and I think more intelligent conversations about democratic erosion and breakdown because we now have this kind of uh, middle category where democracy, regimes that fall below the standards of democracy can fit into um, and a, sec a separate substantive category of autocracies so that we can tell the difference between a, a small move past democracy into the, into the NAND category and a true breakdown of democratic order into an, a substantive autocracy. So uh, thank you so much again for listening to our presentation and we welcome all of your feedback and questions. All right. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. This is really exciting research. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in on Zoom and we're also going to have a lot of questions here. So Zoom people wait on, uh, like we will try to get to all of your questions. For the people in the room, if, first of all, I guess I'll ask all of our speakers, if you could all be on the screen, that would be great. So you can just keep your videos on. Um, for the people in the room, before you ask your question, if you could identify yourself, that would be fantastic. So they can have a sense of being in the room with us. Um, I have Catherine, but hands up, please, if you have a question. All right, Catherine, go ahead. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, hey, good to see you. Hey, Jason. Um, you look exactly the same as when I met you in like, you must have been 22, so <laughs> yeah, you're not that now. And luckily, I'm wearing a mask, so you can't tell whether I do or not. Um, so really interesting work. Welcome back to Virtual Studio URL. Um, and really great ideas. And we are really quite interested in this as a group these days. Um, um, we're talking this afternoon, actually, in our drinking and thinking more about autocracy versus democracies. And, so I think this is really interesting. And as, as you may, Jason will know, but you guys may not, I'm a Russia specialist. So couldn't help but notice Russia under Putin is not on your list there, but is commonly referred to as, as an autocracy. And I would say I, I would not dispute that. So my question is, but one thing I really like about what you're doing is it's always bothered me if you look at Freedom House, Russia and North Korea are the same. And Kazakhstan, you know, which is named its capital after Nur Sultan those are by although now they seem to be going back because he's got some troubles. Um, so you know North Korea and Russia are fundamentally different yet Freedom House classifies them both as a, as a set. So you guys may be helpful in this and kind of finding that that fine grain um, difference.
but I don't think you've quite solved that problem because I was trying to decide, and this is, part, this is my question, where would Russia land? Um, is it a, is it, it, you know, it's one of your tricky cases. Um, it, it isn't, um, doesn't have free, fair and competitive elections, I would say, but I'm worried that your system would show that it does enough um, because the 80% standard, which strikes me, well, could you defend that? Why is it 80%? And then how do you define exclusion? Because there's opposition parties in the form of, let's say, and again, I'm gonna use the Russian case, so forgive me, everyone, the LDPR, which is the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which is neither liberal or democratic, and is, but is a party in Russia, um, but it is, um, you know, purportedly partially funded by the Kremlin. Well, it's allowed to run in elections. Communist Party of the Russian Federation, it's allowed to run in the elections, but Navalny and anybody who's truly oppositional, well, there are ways of making it so they can't run. So on the one hand, if you didn't know that, you would just look at Russia and say, huh, okay, they don't, Putin only won by 62%, you know, he won 62%, not 80, and um, four other candidates ran and they got different votes. Therefore, it's not that exclusive and it's a NAND. But the reality is it's not a NAND, right? Other people are just simply kept off the ballot. And so that, and that's the worry I think with some of the other cases that you would call NANDs, um, maybe, I don't know if you can, Turkey. Um, so yeah, so what about that? Uh, exclusivity seems to be at first blush totally reasonable, but then how, how do you measure that? And then why 80%, why not lower? Can I just add something to that? Um, because Turk was mentioned this. Yeah. Uh, so like, where do the rights fit in your approach? Where do the rights and right. the fit? It might be that like 60% of the vote is being won by the president, but all if all the political liberties and rights are curbed, is it still a democracy or even a, like none? So. Right. Can I also two things? Yeah, can you guys say who you are and we can just make it a massive question, which is fine. <laughs> um, wait, I, wait, I too, can you say, can you identify who you are? Oh, I think they all know. My name is I too, I'm a postdoc at CDDRL. Right. Okay, I'm also a postdoc, my name is Hans. Um, and so I had like a very similar question on this like who kind of vote share, and also like similar to like, um, what we said earlier. Um, so first of all, why, why would you not look at something like seat share, for example, to like kind of like, Examine the like difference, guys. Like, the disproportionality that you might have between seat and vote shares. It's like, in, um, just looking at like voting um, doesn't really count for the fact that like a lot of like regimes just like keep the pool of eligible either candidates or voters are in there, right? And you can obviously look at some like racial exclusion criteria or uh, just like preventing women from like voting, which was, you know, a decade ago, uh, a century ago, or even more recently in other cases. So, you know, it might be true that like a small set, of, like there's a lot of competition between like a small set of voters, but like if a lot of people are excluded, I'm like wondering if your measures actually um, pick that up. Also fraud. All right. Mm -hmm. Whoever would like to answer. I can I can start off or oh. Colleen, do you want to start off? No, you start. Yeah, I, I've got some thoughts, but go ahead, Jason. Well, first, uh, uh, Catherine, your, your question is very well taken. And actually you and Mike have been uh, psych psychologically haunting our discussions for months because once we got this on the calendar, I said, "Okay, we're going to get Russia questions." <laughs> I've got to think about that. So, so you've been doing some reading, now. yeah. So, um, <laughs> one okay. So there's there's two aspects to the question that but to the the cluster of questions. So one is a is a is a theoretical and conceptual one, which is does politically exclusive rule make sense? As a, as a criterion for autocracy. Like if we agree on that, then let's say I delegate to the Russologists, I delegate to the Turkey experts, whether or not the opposition is truly excluded, and then we'll go with that. Um, so the one is if, if we agree on politically exclusive rule as a sound conceptual foundation, then we can have all kinds of um, more technical granular uh, debates and discussions about how to measure it and operationalize it. Um, you know, for now, we've drawn the 80%, I mean, a, a little bit with expediency in mind to try to see where the chips fall. And it is interesting to think about like, okay, where can we start saying the opposition is, is kind of viable? 
And that's why we were saying 20% for the opposition. I mean, certainly, and I think that creates some useful disqualifications immediately. I mean, so, um, and, and here I'll, I'll wrap up and, and pass it to my, my collaborators, but basically I would, I would be happy for us to be discussing Russia and debating Russia and Turkey as the liminal cases. I think those are like, those are like the boundary between autocracy and kind of competitive authoritarianism where elections still matter and the opposition has a decent shot. I think Turkey for me is a little more on the competitive authoritarian, like the opposition. It's, it's, it's possible in the next decade that the opposition comes to power in Turkey. I don't envision the opposition coming to power in Russia in the next decade in elections, but you know, I hope I'm wrong, but. Um, so that, that's where I think the line should be drawn. Right now, I would say the line is being drawn as Ashley showed in the visuals, the line like for VDEM is being drawn way over from that. <laughs> like the US before universal suffrage is being considered an autocracy. They are calling India right now an electoral autocracy. And so we really want to tighten the concept. And I think it would be a, it would be a great step in, in our a productive one if we can if there is some consensus around at least tightening the concept around our concept and then digging in to the, the technical questions of, of measurement after we have that initial consensus. But yeah, Killian, Ashley. So one of the, oh, well, Killian, did you, I remember. Yeah, sorry, I'm having some tech issues. I don't know why my camera's not starting again. It seems to have, anyway, go ahead, Ashley. Okay. Well, I, I would, very much agree with you that we we do need to um, we do need to start thinking about what exclusion means and if it, and I, I really love the point that you brought up if the opposition isn't a real opposition right they're somehow allied to the ruling party maybe we do need to take that into account um, but my concern with applying such a kind of measure operationally especially going to, um, I think your name was I too, I hope that's right. <laughs> um, uh, definition about, you know, racial exclusion and other types of people that we kind of take off the ballot, that would also open up the United States, right? That would also open up pre-apartheid uh, or apartheid South Africa, right? The, a whole chunk of possible pop, uh, politicians and opposition were systematically left off of ballots. And I don't think that many people would say that those places are autocracies in the same way that China is an autocracy in the same way that North Korea is an autocracy or that they're autocracies at all, right? And so we are going to have difficult conversations about how to measure this. And, uh, and inevitably some of us will disagree, but I think Jason is right in saying that we are one, initiating a real conversation that doesn't just say if it's not democracy, it's an autocracy but also we're enabling people to have, you know, to figure out where to set the bar and to decide, well, what side of this line does Russia end up on and why? And we're enabling kind of a, a, a more precise coding of cases with an 80% rule, even if an 80% rule isn't perfect or agreeable to everyone. Killian, oh, hold on, yeah. did Killian wanna add anything? No, I, the, I think my co-authors answer well and I, I'm having issues with my video. The only thing I'm, I would say is um, we are, when we, when we go and apply this rule, what, one thing we're thinking of doing is having a sensitivity where we use a 70% and a 90% threshold as well. So we can see what cases kind of fall in and out when we toggle that. Because I mean, to Jason's point, 80% is somewhat arbitrary. When you're doing these cross-national codings, you do need to send sort of somewhat arbitrary cutoffs. And so that is one thing we're, we're, we're sensitive to, sort of thinking about, you know, what are we going to lose versus gain when we set the bar at different levels, um, you know, recognizing that you just have, you do ultimately have to set the bar somewhere, um, but you need to know what the implications of that decision are. Okay, great. So there's still tons of questions on Zoom and also in the room. I'm going to take two questions at a time here. Um, so Hishan and then Marisa. Uh, thank you, Jason, Killian, uh, and Ashley. Uh, Really, really enjoyed listening to your, uh, to your research and I really appreciate the focus on the big questions, which I find really refreshing. So uh, just a piece of feedback, I'm not sure if this is useful or not, but I think the operative word in the definition that 
the, all these questions are focused on is the question of that word deliberate exclusion, which you displayed in the slides, because it raises the question of whether deliberate exclusion, whether you could have situations where there is no deliberate exclusion, people are being, just being exclusion, excluded through uh, the electoral process, right? So you end up in a situation where you're not able to, you're not able to define which situations uh, you have exclusion due to a deliberate electoral engineering that happens versus situations where uh, you end up with exclusion because uh, the opposition just doesn't have its act together, right? So therefore, what it comes down to is that 80% threshold, right? So what I find really interesting here is that you're running into the same issue that previous, uh, you know, the previous literature on or past literature on electoral authoritarianism tended to run into, specifically with regards to uh, distinguishing between uh, close or hegemonic electoral authoritarianism versus competitive authoritarianism. And it really comes down to the question, does the opposition stand a chance? And what I find really interesting here is that when Mark Howard and Philip Rossler were coding their cases across that spectrum, they picked 70% threshold. And the criticism was always, why 70%? What happens when it becomes, it's 80? What happens when it's 60? So you're running to the same issue. So what I find interesting is that ultimately, you're back to that same square where you're trying to actually retreat uh, from electoral, electorally based definitions of, of uh, autocracy. But you, and when you get to the operation, operation, operationalization stage, you end up in a situation where you're ultimately trying to kind of uh, define your cases through electoral outcomes without being able to find an ex ante standard to determine what falls under autocracy and what falls under non-autocracy or non-democratic non-autocracies. Uh, uh, non so, or the NANS cases that you that you referred to, and I'm wondering whether have you thoughts of like uh, alternative standards, ex ante standards that you could apply to kind of contend with that elusive uh, elusive distinction. And then Marisa. Hi, I'm Marisa Kellum. I'm a visiting scholar here. Um, so I'm also going to talk about this ex this part exclusion term. Um, uh, you, there was two parts to the definition. The first part said something to the effect of, you know, excluded from competing for office. And the second part was about policy making. And, you know, lots of single party dominant majoritarian systems, the minorities parties are pretty much excluded from policy making, but they're democracies, right? So I wondered about that second part of your definition of exclusion. It would take us away from this election part on one hand, the election focus focusing explicit just on that 80% or 70%, it actually gets into whether the opposition makes a difference in government. But on the other hand, there's lots of democracies where the opposition is excluded from government. That's 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 one. And then the competitive oligarchies in particular, for you know, 90% of the population, they're living in a, in an aut autocracy. They are excluded from political rule and um, they cannot participate in policy making. So yes, maybe there was competitive democracy for the 2% of elites in, in Peru who could vote or the, the white South Africans. But for the rest of the people, I would say that's pretty much exclusive. They're excluded from, from political rule. So I wonder particularly about that category. All right, well. Okay, um, co-authors, do you want me to lead off again or anyone else want to take first step? lead if you if you'd like or if you if you feel like you want to okay okay so I'll, yeah. I'll go ahead um so one of the things i, I do want to correct slightly so i think uh the first person who spoke said that the it, the question comes down to is the does the opposition have a real shot and i don't think that's really the question right it's not just can they possibly you know get executive power but are they given a real opportunity but it doesn't really matter the outcome of whether they're able to get it or not but if they're given a chance right if they're
not um, removed from the ballot entirely, completely obstructed in any way, then it doesn't matter if they get their stuff together or not. Like what we're trying to do is move away from measures that require the opposition to uh, be very coordinated, um, you know, that, that require them to win a quote unquote popularity contest of elections um, and instead focus on them actually not being given a real shot um, to, 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 to win an election. Um, on the other question, I think, I think it's really interesting that you're, that you're focused on competitive oligarchies. I feel like we get more questions about the line between competitive authoritarianism and autocracy, which we admit both in the paper and hopefully in the presentation, that is a hard line to define. That is, that is kind of the crux of the empirical exercise is to figure out where the appropriate line between that is. But for competitive oligarchies, and I would agree, right? I am, I'm in no way going to say that for a black South African, you know, uh, that South Africa, apartheid South Africa looked like a democracy. Absolutely not. But I do think that for those people who could participate, there were real political choices, right? Um, or even in America, right? There are real political choices between a party that is more leftist, that will promote a certain type of agenda, and then a party that has a different agenda. And often those real differences between those parties eventually lead to the opening up of political systems, right? So if in fact the, the US only had one choice between what used to be, you know, Dixiecrats and what are, you know, the Republicans now, um, then we probably wouldn't have gotten the, the, you know, the 1964 Civil Rights Act if there was only one choice. But because there were two choices, parties that were split along ideological lines we were able to get a move towards more inclusion over time, right? And those are the types of things that we're not going to see happen under, you know, CC's, well, under a true authoritarian regime because they have one objective and their objective is law. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to just tag on a couple of points to what Ashley just said. So first with respect to competitive oligarchies, yeah, absolutely, we, you, you and us have a like a conceptual um, disagreement there, but it's in a way it's a question of what do you want to put into the definition and like what do you want to put into the concept and then what do you want to put into the side of like the dependent variable side of things that you're trying to explain. For us, you know, like under George Washington, okay, George Washington wins whatever 100%, okay, that's an autocracy. As soon as you get federalists versus anti-federalists, you have substantively moved into a different category and the United States should no longer be considered an autocracy. And that would allow us to actually test whether or not that matters. So it may be the case that that competitive oligarchy could be just as repressive or, you know, it could be, or it could be worse or whatever. But then we were actually able to test it by putting them in different, um, different regime types rather than folding them in. See, our, our concern right now is that the autocracy regime type we get a lot of noise through this residual category. We get a lot of kind of false positives. And so the more we can, we can um, constrain it and sort of and, and empirically and theoretically put some boundaries around it, the more robust our knowledge will be about authoritarianism. Because right now you have these like dramatic headlines about like autocracies are more likely to get involved in conflict or autocracies are more likely to repress or whatever. But I mean, those findings may actually, they could be more dramatic, they could be less dramatic, but right now there's a lot of, a lot of noise and confusion around them, a lot of fuzziness around them because they're based on data sets that are including competitive oligarchies, that are including um, periods where maybe like one election was stolen, but generally speaking, there was, um, there was multi-party competition. And so, um, and this, I'll wrap up here, getting to, to Hisham's point. So yeah, in many ways, we are back to what, um, what Mark and, and Phil were dealing with. Although I think we're, we're being a little more, um, well, I mean, we are, we've, we've read their, their work and we are trying to build on that when, as we think about this NAND category. I guess, ultimately, one way to respond to some of these questions in the next version of the paper would be to say, like, look, um, the controversy is really going to be around this line between like hegemonic and competitive authoritarianism and other people have worked to to um to draw that line and we're drawing it again 
but here's what's at stake. If you draw the line here, it changes like 5%. If you draw the line over here at 80%, it changes like 3%. So we've got to we got to show in the paper like what the payoff is, and I think largely the payoff is in the large number of cases that are not in that liminal space. The large number of cases that are outside of Russia and Turkey, um, where our concept is going to do some useful work in sorting out the non autocracies from the substantive ones. You might you might also start from um, zero instead of starting at 50, 60, 70 going that way. Start no election, start 100% and see how, you know, that seems to fit more with your substantive definition. You know, how do any of those countries that you listed even have elections? Sorry, I just had to get that point. So, you know, start there. And why do you need 20%? Why not 10%? Why not 5%? You know, so, so another thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Are I think this is a good. Yeah, this is a great. But this is why we're going to do the sensitivities at different at different levels. We all we all study the Middle East, where uh, presidents uh, often have elections in which they win ninety nine percent. So we can't have presence or absence of elections. We have to set a threshold somewhere. But 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 I think that's a really good suggestion of setting that at different points and seeing what turns up. Okay, so for the final, I have Eric, and then was there anyone else in the room? Then I'll ask you a few questions that came in on Zoom, and then we'll have you have like a minute or two to respond. So Eric? Uh, Eric Jensen, I'm at the law school in CDDRL. Jason, it's good to see you again. Catherine's right, you aren't aging at all. <laughs> um, I've got a smaller question. Uh, I'm confused uh, by the fact that autocracy does not include the existence or absence of political institutions. I find that very confusing because all of the autocracies that you listed have political institutions or had political institutions. And I'm trying to think of an autocracy that doesn't have political institutions. Um, and then a few things that will be lightning round from Zoom. Steve Krasner, our colleague here, is asking if you plan to break down the NAND category further. Karis Templeman, our colleague at the Hoover Institution, is asking how your concept differs from that of anocracy. Um, or the NAND, maybe that's more a question about NAND rather than pure autocracy. And finally, Brett Carter, also a colleague at Hoover, is asking if um, this is different than the concept of the selectorate, like Bueno, bueno de Mesquita's concept, especially the political exclusive rule component. All right, so in five minutes, you all can answer. Um, Killian, would you like to start? I can take institutions, I can take the first one. Um, so um, actually, I think we're, we're on the same page on this one. So we, we are exactly saying that autocracies often do have institutions. Um, it, it's it, in um, Linz's definition, he has some comments about um, autocracies being more or less institutionalized. Um, there's also debates about whether or not, you know, autocracy, some, some literature on autocracy um, phrases them as sort of um, regimes in which uh, power is raw and which there's no rules for decision making in which everything is at the whim of the dictator. Um, and so these are sort of some implicit um, uh, definitions um, that, that, that are out there and we're trying to kind of set that aside. We're saying actually a lot of, to exactly your point, a lot of autocracies do have institutions and are well institutionalized. And so institutionalization is, is a variable to us that varies across different autocracies and takes different forms. And so it does not belong as an inclusion criterion. It does not belong in the definition of autocracy. It's something that varies a lot across the cases. On, on to Steve's, uh, Steve Krasner's question on breaking down the NAND category. So we, I mean, we are, we are breaking it down in, into those, those five main uh, subcategories. But I don't know if you meant in your question, like, should we break it down on the concept ladder and show like the next step down and how NANDs can be competitive authoritarian, anarchical, um, transitional. Um, with respect to anocracy um, and selectorate theory, um, you wanna, I, I can take one of those. Ashley, you wanna take one of them? Oh, sure, whichever one you wanna take, I'll take the other. Okay, so on anocracy, um, anocracy in polity is defined on a spectrum um, and based on their additive method of create, giving you a score from negative 10 to positive 10. And I think uh, anocracy is something like negative five to positive five. So it doesn't have the 
the discrete conceptual meaning and definition that we're trying to get with NANs. And in some some of our um, yeah, some of our autocracies, we might have a polity score like of a negative three or negative two and be an, an anocracy by polity. Um, and the polity anocracy category, while it could, I mean, hypothetically, it could substantively mean something, it's been critiqued for not really substantively specifying a, a specific um, political phenomenon. And we're, I mean, James Vreeland's critique is, is one of the big ones out there. And we are trying with NANs to say, like, look, here's, here's substantive autocracy on one side, substantive democracy, and then here's what's actually going on in the NAN space in terms of the major categories of, of regimes that don't qualify on either side. To quickly uh, tack on to that, I think that the big difference is that with all the other co concepts that exist, they are still based on this kind of residual uh, understanding right and so they either include way too much or if they were developed more qualitatively are probably too tight right and so so that our NAND co category encompasses those very tight things like competitive oligarchy competitive um authority but so again sets aside the acceptance of autocracies that could end up in anocracy that could end up in a liberal definition of a hybrid regime um etc but for the selectorate question, I, I, we have grappled with this. Um, we used to have a slightly different uh, definition of autocracy. We kept getting the selectorate question, so we looked more into selectorate theory. And to a certain extent, we do believe that right there will probably be a very small group of people ruling. But when it comes to operationalizing what that looks like, even for Buena de Mesquita, it, it varies quite widely. So the selectorate in Russia, right? could be the Communist Party, which is a million people. That's a lot of people being able to make decisions and have effects on policymaking, et cetera, according to a selectorate theory measure. And we want something a lot tighter than that, right? We know that it's not gonna be a million people who are making decisions in Russia. Um, and so we decided to kind of try to distance ourselves from the concept of the selectorate. Yes, it will probably include a very narrow ruling clique, but it, it it's probably best that we, we you know, evoke selectorate theory directly because it can get us into some problems with our operationalization. All right, amazing. Well, you, this is an amazing project. The paper is available on our website. Thank you so much for joining us, albeit virtually today. And thank you to our Zoom audience as well. Thank you, thank you to you. Thanks so much. Good to see you all. Thank you. Good seeing you all virtually.